Jesus did not come so people far from God could find him. He came to find people who were far from God. There are many ways to get lost, but there is one way to be found, through the message and ministry of Jesus. And once Jesus finds you, he bids you to join him in his search and rescue mission. The greatest act of love is to help someone find Jesus. That is why we ask you to find your one. Welcome to the hills. I'm thankful for all of you that are making it a priority today to worship the Lord. I want to send a greeting to all of you in person at our Keller campus. And it's a joy to say that. And to all of you in person at West Fort Worth and North Richard Hills. And especially all of you that watch online. Uh, we have a large online community of people who join us around the world every week. And because you are so faithful to watch online, uh, I know that even though we've never met, you feel in some ways like you know me. And one of the things you probably know is that I don't come from a large family, on either side of my family. And uh, I'm an older brother. I just have a brother, Mark. He and his wife, Debbie, attend our Keller campus. I'm two years older, but because he was larger and more athletic, we really were more like twins than older and younger brother for a long time. And he was a real and continues to be a joy in my life. Now, uh, like a lot of young brothers, I brought some pictures. Like a lot of kids, our parents liked to dress us alike when we were boys. And so you can see we had the same pajamas. We wore the same bow ties going to church. We got the same clothes every year for Christmas, including our good looking robes. We loved to play together and especially sports. We couldn't always be on the same team because of ages. Sometimes we could. Again, he was larger and more athletic. And so sometimes we could even be on the same team. One thing you need to know, we grew up in the 60s and 70s. The single most awful fashion decades of American history. <laughs> and so our clothes and our haircuts were pretty pitiful. However, I would like to point out, because they're coming back, we were rocking the short shorts before short shorts were cool. So I have so many stories I could tell you about my brother. But the most famous story in our family, it is a legend, is a story I don't remember because I was only two years old when it happened. I've heard it so many times in my mind I can see it, but I can't say I actually remember it. You see, uh, for a long time after I was born, we lived with my mother's parents, my papa and my nanny. I was the first grandchild. They spoiled me rotten. I adored them. So I'm at their home, I'm about two years old, and they walk in one day with this little poop machine and put him in my papa's lap, my papa's lap, where I belong, and he's there. And nobody asked me about this. Nobody sought my permission to change the dynamic of our family. All I know is that this thing is where I'm supposed to be getting what I'm supposed to be getting. And so I waddled across the room in my cloth diaper, so I'm told, and aggressively poked my brother in the eye. <laughs> now you might think, what terrible behavior. And I would say, no, no, no. I was simply modeling a long line of biblical tradition. Have you ever read much about brothers in the Bible? The first brothers, Cain and Abel, how did that end? The next set of famous brothers, Jacob and Esau, treachery, deceit, lying. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And go read about David's sons and how well they got along. Now I say all that because we're in this series called Find Your One, looking at Jesus' stories about being lost in Luke 15. And in that chapter is the most famous story ever told. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus didn't call it that. Because if you look close, this is how the story starts. A certain man had two sons. This is a story about brothers. And what makes Jesus such a brilliant storyteller is that he knows there's more than one way to be lost. 
So let's finish the story in Luke 15, starting in verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And all that time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost. But now he's found. Like I said, Jesus is a brilliant storyteller because he understands there's more than one way to be lost. For example, all of you have, who've had parents, I mean, you've been parents of small kids. You ever lost a kid in your own house? I mean, you can't find your kid and he's in your own house. You can stay home and get lost. See, this father didn't have one lost son. He had two. He had one son, a younger one, who was lost to him spatially away in a far country. And he had another son lost to him relationally, even though he never left the farm. And both boys had the same problem. They didn't know their dad. This younger son had no idea how adored he was by his father, but the boy that stayed home had no idea as well. In his view, his place at the father's table had to be earned. So he dutifully obeyed. In fact, notice he used the word slave. All these years I have slaved for you. What father wants to hear a child say, our relationship is you're the master? And I'm the slave. Now, it's real easy when we read this story to be very contemptuous of the older brother. But for a couple of minutes, I want to try to put you in his shoes. Think about it. He was dutiful. While the younger son is out there having a party, he's working in the field. He's bringing in the crop. He's paying the bills. He's keeping the farm solvent. If he hadn't been faithful, there may not have been a home for the younger son to come back to. Here's why this is important. I want you to understand, self-righteousness can only exist in a heart that values righteousness. A heart that values nobility and decency and morality. It's only because you value these things that the temptation to be self-righteous can even happen. Uh, for example... Jesus tells a story about two men that go to a temple to pray. And one of the guys, he is a decent, noble man. He values righteousness. Notice, though, how he prays. He says, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Now, hold on before you condemn. You've prayed that prayer. I have, too. Now, maybe not out loud, maybe not even consciously. But you saw the guy leaning up against the alley wall, drinking a bottle out of a paper sack. You saw the fellow on the side of the road holding up the cardboard sign, wanting some food. You saw the lady spending her last three dollars at the convenience store on a lottery ticket. You saw the boys walking down the street with their pants halfway down their legs. And you thought, oh, I thank God I'm not them. Now, you've had those thoughts. I've had those thoughts. When you really do want to make better choices and live by better values, the enemy tempts you to think that makes you a better person. You see, the older brother wasn't far from his father because he was wicked. He was far from his father because he thought he was so well. But notice that the father noticed he was missing. That's the thing about God. He notices when any of his children are missing. And he goes out to him. 
Because God loves the self-righteous as much as he loves the unrighteous. And by the way, some of you need to hear that. It is so easy to mock and criticize and post your contempt of the self-righteous. And you can do that, but you're not being like Jesus. Because he loves the self-righteous as much as the unrighteous. I want to show you that each week we've been looking at Jesus having an encounter with someone who was lost in a different kind of way. So this week we're going to look at a story of a man who's lost in his goodness. We're in Mark chapter 10. We'll start in verse 17. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came up to him running and knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. He had no idea how self-righteous he just sounded. Look at the next line. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. There's so many takeaways from that story. I'm going to give you three quickly. One, please notice Jesus had great love for a person that had too great an opinion of themselves. Remember that. Number two, this man embodied what I would call elder brother theology. In other words, he believed that the goal of life is to accrue commandment-keeping currency. The more commandments you keep, the more you earn, which makes your chance of getting a place at the Father's table more sure. So his goal in life was to earn more commandment-keeping currency than other people. And the final thing I would point out is that Jesus let him walk away. A good man. You like this guy if he was your neighbor. You want this guy to come to your church and be the small group leader of your teenager. You want this guy to be your business partner. You want this guy to be your freshman son's roommate in college. You want this guy to ask your daughter to the prom. And Jesus let him walk away. Because even though he was a good man, his whole life was based on a bad question. What must I do to inherit? Do you hear the contradiction in terms? What must I do to inherit? He wasn't asking, how can I be a more beloved son? He was asking, how can I be a better slave? And Jesus is really good at finding the lost. He could find the one who wandered like Levi, and Levi would start following him. He could find the woman wounded at the well, and she started telling people he was the Messiah. He could even find the rebel like a thief on a cross and bring him to paradise. Here's the irony. The hardest group of people for Jesus to find and invite to the party were the people who thought they were well. Now maybe that describes your one. Or maybe that describes you. So um, four quick principles from this story. And the first, you need to hear this. Someone can be good and lost. Good and lost. And I know that what I just said is offensive and rebuke the dominant theology of our day. In our nation, as, as many problems as we have, most people still have some concept of God. Most people think there probably is a God. There probably is some kind of life after death. There probably is some kind of judgment. And I'm probably okay because I think I've been a good 
person. If Satan can't separate you from God through immorality, he will separate you from God by confidence in your morality. And some are far from God, not in spite of their goodness, but because of their goodness. You see, nobody is harder to save than the somebody who thinks they're better than everybody. And this is not to say that these people think they're perfect. No, they would never claim to be perfect. They just think they're better. They think God grades on the curve. And I'm not going to get a perfect score on my exam, but my score is going to be higher than most people's. In fact, in a sad and even kind of sick way, they almost rejoice when they see other people fail or fall or suffer because it makes them feel better about themselves. And they don't understand that their definition of good is so bad. I've used this illustration before. Several years ago, I took my family skiing to New Mexico. We were on a highway out in the country. uh, And there was a pasture to the side of the road with a flock of sheep. The pasture had patches of dirt and mud. And against that background, the wool on those sheep looked very, very white. You could not miss them. We skied for a few days. We came back, and that day, a huge snowfall fell. So we're on the same highway driving by the same pasture. But this time, there's about 10 inches of brand new, pristine white snow. And against that background, the wool on those sheep looked Filthy. See, it depends on what you compare it to. That's why when the man walked up, good teacher, the first thing Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. In other words, Jesus is saying no one is good enough. You need to hear this. Because if the goal is just to be good, you don't need to be a Christian. There's all kinds of religions and all kinds of moralities that can teach you to be a better person. But the consistent witness of Scripture is that no one is qualified to save themselves. That no one is good enough. Romans chapter 3, as the Scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, this is why the gospel is offensive to people. You're telling me I'm as bad as these, and they have a long list of the people that they think are bad people. No, I'm not saying the Bible says everyone is equally bad. I'm saying the Bible says everyone without Jesus is equally bad off. Here's what you need to hear. You're not good in God's eyes because you're just sometimes sinful and other people are mostly sinful. You're not good in God's eyes because I just sin some of the time and they sin all the time. No, you all fall short of the glorious standard. What is the glorious standard? It's perfect holiness. You say, Pastor, that's impossible. Nobody can be perfectly holy but God. Right. Only God can meet the perfect righteous standard that God has set. Only God can do that. And he did. This is the mystery and the majesty of the gospel. No other faith in the world remotely has an answer. Like the Christian answer. That God put on flesh. And God did not become a sinner like us, but became sin for us. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Titus 3 says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done. You will never earn enough currency. That's not why He saved you. But because of His mercy, because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence 
that we will inherit eternal life. I got the best job in the world. I get paid to tell people this. I get paid to announce good news, not good advice, not good advice on how to be better at being good. Good news. And the good news is people aren't saved because they're good. They're saved because they're forgiven. Because in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of a good God has been applied to you. No one is good enough, but grace is available for any one. And that leads to the next principle. Boy, this is so important. If you don't get this next principle, then you'll never really believe the one I just shared. See, here's our struggle to believe in the grace of God. It's a struggle to believe that everyone can have everything. See, this is where the elder brother needed to come to his senses. He, he was lost at home because he believed two big lies. Lie number one, the father's love is conditional. You have to earn it. You earn his love by what you produce. That's a lie. Number two, the father's inheritance is inadequate. There's not enough to go around. You see, he was convinced that his father's generosity to someone else was going to cost him. See, I don't remember the story, but I can just imagine in my little two-year-old unregenerate mind, why did I poke my brother in the eye? Because he was in my papa's lap getting affection. And in my little mind, he's getting what should go to me. My papa only has so much affection. And any affection he gives to another brother is affection I could never get. It could never dawn on my little sinful brain. My papa has enough love so that all of his grandsons will get all that they need. The scripture says that all the blessings of your inheritance in Christ are for all of you. The older brother couldn't figure that out. He lacked confidence in the abundance of his father. And so, yeah, it comes across like he is disgusted by his brother. But his disgust of his brother was driven by his distrust of his father. All those years, he said, I did the right thing. I was the dutiful slave. You never once gave me a goat so I could have a party. And the father comes back and says, son, have all the parties you want. Take all the goats you want, dear son. Everything I have is yours. He's compelling his son to stop thinking like a slave. And the story ends. We don't know if the older brother ever came to his senses. We know the younger brother did. But the older brother, did he ever come to his senses? We don't know. But I know I did. You see, each week in this series, we've had a video testimony. Well, this week, I'm the testimony. You see, I am a recovering older brother. <laughs> a little more of my story. You've heard me say in the early years of our family, my folks had a lot of problems. They didn't know really the Lord and when my parents got back together after being separated and we started going to church, our family started working. And in my little seven-year-old brain, if you go to church and if you do the right things, things get better. And so I became that kid. I became the rule keeper. I was the yes ma'am and no ma'am and do what you're told kid. Teachers loved me. Grandmas loved me. Dads wanted their daughters to date me. The daughters didn't. They thought I was boring. <laughs> and sadly, whether they meant to or not, somehow my church enforced my misunderstanding. That if you want to be sure of your future with God, you better get it right. You better follow the rules. You better have the right doctrines. You better have the right behaviors. And I tried hard to be that boy. And here's the problem. 
I couldn't do it. I tried. But I knew deep down, I don't get do it right all the time very well. I can remember at night sometimes thinking, if I died tonight, would I go to heaven? I wasn't sure. Now get this, this is so important. What do you do when you are afraid of your father? When you're afraid your father may not let you come to his table. How do you handle that stress and that tension? Here's what you do. If you know you can't be as good as your father, your goal becomes be better than my brother. And so sometimes that came out in my young man, as a young man, that came out as seeming like I had contempt for or disdain for other people. It wasn't contempt and it wasn't hate. It was fear. My problem wasn't really my bad view of my brother. It was my wrong view of my father. But I came to my senses. You say, what happened? Well, the father came out to the field. He just kept chasing me. The father just kept pursuing me. The father loves the self-righteous as much as the unrighteous. And the father helped me come to my senses. How did he do that? Well, the scriptures, I just... The more I poured into the scriptures, the more I saw his grace. Spirit-led conversations with wise Christian mentors. And maybe most of all, a growing intimacy with the Holy Spirit. You see, if you do not grow up able to, to have intimacy with and ability to hear the Holy Spirit, you will not hear the Spirit of God speak the words of affirmation, you are a child of God. Romans 8 says, So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm we are God's children. And since we are his children, notice, we are his heirs. We get the inheritance. We get everything. The Father wants us to have. The story starts in Luke 15 with people criticizing Jesus. Why do you hang out with the people you hang out with? And he tells these stories. His goal wasn't to change your mind about their brother. His goal was to change your mind about their father. When you know that you are an heir, you have so much more compassion on the heiring. And here's what happens. Anyone who finds grace finds others. See, Jesus isn't just inviting us to the celebration party. Jesus is asking us to join the rescue party. Found people find people. So, in as presumptuous a thing as I've ever done in a sermon, let me suggest the greatest story ever could have been better. It could have had a better ending. What if Jesus had told the story this way? There was a father and he had two sons. And the younger son came and said, give me my inheritance now. And he took it and he went off to a far country and he wasted it on wild and sinful living and dishonored the father's name. But every day the father would go out to the porch and look down the road. And his heart broke. For his lost son. And also in the house there was an older brother. Who loved his dad. And he couldn't stand to see his father's heart so broken. So one day he went to his bedroom and got a suitcase and a backpack. And he got all the money together he could get. And he went out to find his younger brother. He went to the far country. He went to the bars. And he went to the brothels. And he heard he was out working in servitude to a pig farmer. And he found him in a barn, feverish and weak. And he was about to pick him up when the pig farmer burst in and said, you can't have him. He's in debt to me. He's my slave. And the older brother says, then I'll give you everything I've got, all my privilege and all my wealth, to pay his debt for him. 
And then he picked up his younger brother and he started home. And the father was out on the porch and he looked down the road and he saw his two boys. And he took off and he ran and he, he showered them with hugs and kisses and tears. And they all went back in the house and they had the most wonderful party. And there was much joy. Well, in a way, Jesus did tell that story. Because that's his story. Jesus is the older brother who came to look for his younger brothers and sisters. And I know he went to the cross because he loves you and me, but Jesus went to the cross because he loves his dad. And he knew what would make his dad happy. He really, really is good at finding lost people. Even the good and lost. And he's asking us to come and join him. Would you bow your head? We're wrapping up this series. I'm going to pray over you, but here's what I want you to do. For just a moment, let the Father bring to your mind right now a person in your life that is far from God. Just think about them while I pray, okay? And so God... We confess your goodness. You are a good father. You don't keep back anything from your children. You shower us with grace. We don't have to perform to get your love. We just have to trust and receive it. And so God, because you are so good, we're asking you to create in the next month an opportunity for us to have a a hard, good, kind, truthful conversation with someone who doesn't know who you really are. And we believe you will do this because you love your kids even more than we do. So we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen.